Okay, this is uh, season one, episode 10, the final episode of season one uh, with Money Talks, the podcast hosted by Becoming Financially Fit. I am the host, Stacey Blunt, and I'm here with my guest, Mo Osman. Mo, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Stacey. This is an honor to be here, and I'm glad to see where, where you've come with this, and this is, this is really amazing and a true honor to, to, to be part of it. Definitely. Um, so I'll just kick it off um, talk about um, how we met. Um, mm-hmm. So we met through a mutual friend, um, some of the guys I know from Fordham University, yeah. um, and we kind of introduced each other. Um, it's a coincidence that we work together as well. Um, JP Morgan is a big firm, but we do work together. Um, so we kind of had a, a bunch of discussions when I was actually first joining the firm. Yeah. And you actually told me a lot about the actual firm, yeah. what people make, what you should be making, how you can move yeah. through it. So that yeah. helped me out a lot. And that's originally how we met. Um, but I do want to give you an opportunity to just to talk to, about your background a little bit um, yeah. so people can kind of know who you are as a person. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm Osmond, as, as Stacey just said. And, you know, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm on the client team within JP Morgan Asset Management within its uh, global alternatives team. Uh, what that means is basically I work with institutional investors and a bunch of ultra high net worth investors as well to you know find sol- real uh, investing solutions within an alternative space like say real estate, maritime, transportation, uh, infrastructure, things like that. I specifically focus on uh, European real estate investing. So we uh, my client I advise you know we advise our clients as to as to what they could do within that space as to where they could invest in Europe within real estate, what we're thinking, provide them solutions, pr- provide them, you know, account updates and things like that. And um, and when I say institutional, I think it's that's, that's a broad term that people yeah, use and people don't know what that really means. Um, so institutional means basically non, think of it as a non-retail. When I say retail, I mean like you and I, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the day, you and I are really just truly retail. Um, uh, retail is your mom and dad, you know, their 401k or that 50k that they have in E-Trade, uh, mm-hmm. which is now Morgan Stanley, if you guys have been uh, reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, and where institutional is more, think the big corporations, right? Think your Or cor- insurance companies. Or insurance yeah. companies um, in general, governments, sp- really governments, like uh, I actually cover a lot of governments. Um, as well as, you know, government sponsored entities like, you know, Fannie Freddie, think mm-hmm. of... Uh, as well as you know, central banks, et cetera, which basically need to invest to match liabilities, right? So the, the, let's say if it's a pension plan for Apple or something that you know they have liabilities to match, um, or or if it's a, a, a public pension plan in in California billions, and, and the yeah. billions, and these are people who are you know writing tickets, or these are institutions that are writing you know you know giving us you know about fifty million dollars at a time, or or you know, above that. And, mm-hmm. you know, for example, for a separate account, I think for us, it's, 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 you, know, you have to have sizable ticket at around, you know, 300 plus million dollars, right? To be able to say, just hey, to be JP considered. Morgan, yeah, to be considered to say, JP Morgan, would you guys please just hear and, 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 and invest this, you know, generally speaking, that's how, that's how it works. And, and retail again, would be more of us, more of the 50 Ks, the, yeah. the, 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 a uh, hundred, up to a hundred thousand, 250,000 in investable assets. That doesn't mean your net worth, that means in, in just assets that you can put actually it's liquid to, assets, work. Yep. to work. Mm-hmm. Exactly. People usually commonly, you know, mistake that. Like I could have a five hundred thousand house. N- uh, yeah, yeah. five hundred thousand <laughs> house purely equity. Yeah. That doesn't mean I have five hundred K in, in investable assets, right? Mm-hmm. That it could be much less. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And that's uh, that it's that's sort Which, of a liquid. That, that's usually how it is for normal Americans. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I'll get into that about you know houses and stuff like that. And I know we're gonna talk about real estate specifically, but yeah. um but and also you have to think from from our from our end, what we do professionally is we in invest in think you know skyscrapers you know depending on the strategy if it's a uh, um, so there's their core there's core investing for, for those who don't know there's core investing there's value add investing there's opportunistic investing across the risk spectrum and um, basically the, the the higher you go uh, up on that risk spectrum the higher your risk is mm-hmm. but the higher your return targets are going to be but usually what we're doing is w- across that risk risk spectrum whether it's core whether it uh, core meaning we're buying skyscrapers in the middle of London or the middle of uh, maybe not right now, but in the middle of uh, Berlin or or, or or middle of Milan versus say um, a value add where you're buying that same building in that same area. However, it's an older building, it's a mismanaged building. Um, you undervalued. Know, undervalued. Tenant leases are short. You want to extend leases. You want to do things like that. These are corporate tenants. Um, and or versus an opportunistic, which is either a purely vacant building mm-hmm. in a good area or an outskirts of. So think, um, you know, if, if I bring this back to the U.S., it's, it's sort of like, you know, versus buying a skyscraper in downtown, you're buying a large corporate campus 
in um, Decatur, Georgia versus yeah. say Atlanta, mm-hmm. right? Um, or Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn versus say uh, Midtown Manhattan or Financial District. Mm-hmm. It's 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 that that's the kind of uh, uh, so depending on what what you know what what's best for our clients, we serve our clients and we, we try to give them the best uh, solution that works for them. And, uh, and personally, yeah, like how'd you grow up? Talk about that background. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Um, so how I got into this is, is, is it's crazy because if you realize that I'm I, I was originally born in Sudan. It's uh, for those who don't know, it's a country in um, Africa, mm-hmm. right? And it's uh, when I was born about three years before I was born, there was a coup d'état. So there was you know is is you know one of the I guess negative impacts of one of the many negative impacts of imperialism and and, and colonialism is that you know um, Africa in itself is a very unstable you know, uh, a country in the sense that these borders were man-made, you know what yes, I mean? Like they these were. Are, they're, they're, there are a lot of tribes and a lot of, you know, you know, different ethnicities that they were just bunched up together. For example, Sudan being one of them. Sudan was a UK colony, actually. Um, Sudan and Egypt were one country at one time, right? And then it was actually called the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, this is re- relatively recent. And only in 19, after, you know, 1956, that's when we first got our independence from Egypt. That's crazy. Did not know that. Exactly. 1956. 56, literally. Yeah. My, my, my dad was a grown man <laughs> when this happened, right? Um, I could be wrong. It was 56 of those out there. It could be 58, something, something <laughs> like that. But I think it's 56. Um, uh, but it's relatively recent, right? And, you know, it just goes to show about, you know, that 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 these are completely, you know, it, we're, we're closer, you know, we're closer to the Egyptian people, but it's it's, it's a distinctly different country. Yeah. And now most recently, I think in the, in the, in the, 2000s in the mid 2000s actually like I think 2005 2006 uh, in that in that sense um, South Sudan seceded from the from the um, from the country so uh, actually in, tw- in I think 2006 it was, I think it was tw- 2011 or 2011? again my numbers are way off but <laughs> it's, it's 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 closer than people really realize how did you make the move from Sudan to the states uh, I was about four when we came when we uh, three going on four when we came out here um, and so back to that coup d'etat point it was. You know, my dad was really, uh, uh, he was a government, you know, civil servant yeah. for his entire yeah. life for the Democratic co- uh, uh, government at the time. He was actually the deputy minister of agriculture. And, um, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was also the head of their animal resource bank at the time. And, you know, in 89 when the coup d'etat happened. For the entire had, country. For the entire country, yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's crazy. So, actually, put this in perspective, uh, at the time, this is probably in the 80, uh, early 80s or something, um, Sheikh Zayed, for those who don't know, that's it for the Emirates. If you guys have been to Dubai, been mm-hmm. whatever, he actually invited my dad to a personal dinner and, and asked him to be kind of his, you know, animal resource, agricultural, like, head or advisor. And, you know, you have to understand at the time, though, that, you know, the Emirates were not the Emirates that you see today. Abu yeah. Dhabi and Dubai and mm-hmm. Al Ain and Sharjah were not anything you see today. It was, it was just a desert. desert. Yeah. Purely a desert. And Sheikh Zayed was, again, famous person, you know, very great and everything. But, um. It wasn't anywhere near. He had a vision, mm-hmm. um, but it was nowhere near what it is now. And uh, he asked my dad. He said, "You know, do you want to, uh, you know, work for me? Come for me? Like, you know, uh, I'll give you the Emirati citizenship. I'll do this. I'll do that." Wow. And it was crazy. And it, 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 it wasn't just him. It was him plus another like a lot of the other regional folks, um, like from Egypt, from Ethiopia, who were sort of in, 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 in other spaces like economic, like things. People who were familiar with a, a desert like. Um, um, climate and uh-huh. were able to adjust their agriculture and their trade and their animals in that sense. Um, and uh, basically, my dad turned it down because he said, "You know, I'm, I, I'm. He, he's a civil servant. He's like, I, I, my country, Sudan is my country, and I need to. Damn. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was really, you know, he was, he was all for it. He was very democratic, very patriotic. And mm-hmm. then, you know, fast forward twenty years, uh, like you know, whatever, a few years, ten years later, or whatever it is. And then, um, he's there's a coup d'état, and he was against the military that, that took was over. over. Yeah. And Basically, it was like get out of here, <laughs> and yeah. he had to give up his post in the same country that you know he, that he died. Pretty much would love to die for. Like, exactly, it literally wow. just turned their back on him. And now, just recently, I think like uh, uh, last year or so, the president that president who took over in '89 was actually the, like taken like uh, pro, like through protest was actually taken out of power. And, and so it took over 30 years to get this guy down. And um, just, and 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 if if anyone knows about Sudan, what's going on? It's it's, it's a Dire economic situation. I think I read a report about IFC being it. it, it you know, it's it's a situation where, you know, the it was mismanaged for over thirty years, yeah. rampant corruption. Yeah. But you see that throughout all of Africa, right? It's yes. like it's like you why, know. Why it, is that? Again, I think it's all you know imperialism and colonialism, yeah. right? That that I can't blame it solely, but I think you know that's what happens when you don't allow these 
country to develop, you know, by themselves and have their own sovereignty for so long. Mm -hmm. You'll have all these players who, you know, when you bunch up, you know, a people who, who aren't like one another, but there, there are going to be factions. There are going to be, there's going to be divisions, like like pure polarized divisions within a lot of, like if you think the U.S. is bad with its Democrats and <laughs> yeah. liberals, like I can show you, you can go to any African country where, where you could have five different, you know, conservatives or liberals and, yeah. and, and every five years some, another one takes over or a different one and it's the same old thing over and over and it's, it's always, you know, a case of corruption, a case of mismanagement, a case mm -hmm. of that. And again, I think it's just we just we're, we're, we're we haven't been allowed to, to, to make those mistakes. And unfortunately, now we're living those mistakes. But hopefully it means that in the future, you know, these African nations would finally be able to um, move forward and, 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 and get out of that and be able to become stabilized, sovereign countries. Yeah. Um, nonetheless. So when my when my dad, uh, when the coup d'etat happened, my dad tried to stick around for a little bit. Um, try to find work, but it's hard. Right. You know, um, it's very fortunate. A lot of people, you know, were imprisoned. A lot of people were. That's crazy. Um, yeah, and it was it was a, when they were coming in. There was a very Islamist country. My dad is, you know, he's he's a he's a he's a, he's a Muslim man. He's he's a, he's devout. He was a devout Muslim. Mm -hmm. But let me put this in perspective. Where my you know my dad you know he was older by the way. So I'd say he was born in thirty seven. Just to, to give uh, wow. Yeah, he was born in nineteen thirty seven. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away about two uh, two years is the anniversary coming up tomorrow actually. Um, uh, but he he was he was pretty old. He was pretty up there, and he. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about the time he was telling me that when he came out of college, right, he would be in a Khartoum, which is our is our is our uh, capital. He would come out of the University of Khartoum and he'd look across, and there'd be bars all over. Like you know, think of just you know normal <laughs> yeah. like you know Ohio State or yeah. think of Fordham. Think of think of that. And then you know now if you go there, it's like what there are people you know you can't drink publicly. It's against you know it's it's a very um, I. Like there's no such thing as secularism, right? It's, yeah. it's just purely an Islamist state. And and when they came in, my dad, you know, he just wasn't with it. He was he was like, listen, I'm Muslim, I'm Muslim, but he felt that we shouldn't impose on other people. We shouldn't be able to do that, and there should be that church, a separation between church and state, right? Uh, but you know, a lot of people didn't feel like that. A lot of people mm -hmm. felt like, and and they're, and they're allowed to. And um, he just wasn't with that. So, but you know, he he was very fortunate where he didn't get a lot of trouble, but he couldn't find work at all. Yeah. And it was impossible. And you can't, you know, I was just born in 92. When uh, you were, um, when you're going through that, do you kind of understand it? Or no, you, not, not at all. Not at all. And I, that, that's the thing. So when I was born, I was born in 92, three years after this, I didn't understand that my dad at the time was out of a job for three years. Yeah. Um, that all his assets were seized. Now, these are assets. He's a civil servant. He wasn't a corrupt person. He was literally working his ass off for all those years, devout, you know, had properties, <coughs> had had everything in the world, uh, um, and literally seized by the government for no apparent reason. <laughs> Actually, just now we had that release. Like I went back to Sudan in December. We were working on getting, I that, getting yeah. yeah, getting that released for him and his estates. Already now, now as um, as a POA of his estate, I had to go. But um, it it was it, it's it, it was it was a dire situation. But I wasn't aware of that. And, yeah. they, and they made their my parents made their best efforts to to shield that from me. So what my dad did after that is, and I was born in 92, and then around, you know, about a few years later, we tried to move, he tried to go around, you know, other nations and see, you know, develop his networks and see what he could do. But because it, where he was before in his position, you know, mm -hmm. you don't, you know, you can't yeah. just get a normal job, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then um, he tried, you know, to get other jobs, similar jobs in, in government and, 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 and um, NGOs or whatever. Uh, and the networks that were now there in Sudan would, you know, still find their way to, because they're trying to stop anyone who's against the regime to from from actually expanding or advancing their careers any further mm -hmm. that could risk the the, the, the regime, right? So it's real. It's real, man. People don't understand that, man. It's real. This is this is this is real, man. And um, so luckily, my mom, her brothers, my uncles were um, here in here in here in New York and the Bronx, who made really well for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And they were, you know. Uh, I guess recruiting my dad and my mom, they're like, hey, come by. You guys are older now. Like, you should, you shouldn't be working. They're telling my dad, you shouldn't be yeah. working. You're, 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 you're at the age you could retire. You're like, you shouldn't be doing that. Just mm -hmm. retire. He's like, how can I retire? They took all my assets. They did all this. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, no, don't worry about it. You know, luckily my uncles did very, very well for themselves when they came here. Um, funny story, they they came here in about the '60s, late '60s, to New um, York, to New York, and they literally, there were nights they they told they, they were telling me all the time there were nights that they slept on subways. Like there were nights that they came with. Seventeen dollars in her pocket, like it was literally nothing, and they didn't know a lick of English, and literally, you know, from that to at the peak of their, I think, uh, of their wealth, which, um, you know, it's an amazing story, but it kind of shows why their wealth kind of disappeared as they as they got old, tapered off. Um, 
at the peak of their uh, uh, of their riches. You know, they had apartments all over Manhattan, Midtown. That they owned. Yeah, they owned wow. wedding venues. They owned all these types of you know small shops. They actually in the neighborhood. So the reason when we moved in. Uh, when to we the came, Bronx. To the Bronx. When we, we came to the U.S., we went straight to the Bronx. They live there is because a lot of their, you know, um, the, the, the portfolio of, I guess, stores that they were working with, that they were owning and they were trying to manage and building, were in the Bronx at the time. So, and the largest actual, like, um, we used to have, he, um, Uncle Eddie used to have a, uh, uh, a wedding hall that was actually his, his best asset at the time. Um, that was actually in the Bronx, and we would host, you yeah. know, there, there'd be, it used to be a de facto club, and some places it was huge, I'm thinking like, you know, 30,000, you know, um, uh, uh, square meters or yeah. something, like it's mm-hmm. huge, it was huge, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, I think, and, and this goes into what, who I am today, it's, 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 I guess, through mismanagement, through just not understanding, you know, not having that schooling of business and how business works, and not having a formal business, and, and, and you know, they, they I guess... Not that they made the wrong financial decisions because they wouldn't have been where they were if they did, but it was more about they made the more behavioral mistakes that I think I learned from from yeah. just seeing it. Yeah. For example, trusting folks with, with with contracts instead of having contracts. Sorry, you know things Man, like that. Yeah. Like you know to make like you know you know you hear about the you know like think of rappers. You know right like 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 signing the deals. Three sixty. Signing deal. Yeah. What a deal? Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever. Just come on, give me the chain, give me whatever you want. Yeah. Like that's what I and, and but to them it was, it was much, not as bad as I. It was more like. I'll trust this guy, this guy that I've been making deals with for like 30 years, you know, okay, so the deed's a little, there's a lead on a deed, all right, whatever, you know, I'll wait, he'll get it right. I yeah. trust him. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, that usually, you know, never ends up yeah. well. And, yeah. and all it takes is one contract. All it takes is one contract. All it takes is one contract. Mm-hmm. From the, the Bron- or Sudan mm-hmm. to the Bronx, um, then Fordham. Then Fordham. So but how, how'd you decide on Fordham out of all colleges that you can go to? So... That's a funny thing. So I went back to go back again. My parents were really old, like I said earlier. Um, and as I got, you know, I was growing up, I was always good at school. I think mm-hmm. I think I'm going to show you how I transitioned into school because that's that's a big part of my life that really formed who I am today. Yeah. So as I was going through school, you know, I was really good. You know, there were points in, in school where I was offered. You know, I remember being in elementary school and 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 you know my state test scores that were posted, like all these things that 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 all these testing, like standardized testing at the time. I don't know if you guys remember No Child Left Behind. Yeah. Uh, so you know I was in failing schools all my life as growing up in the Bronx. But, public you know, schools. Public schools, of course. Yeah. yeah, public schools, and I would have, and I would I would I would score on these benchmarks so highly, like literally we'd have you know schools come to us and visit and say, hey, like could we. Uh, like, like, would you be interested in this school? Would you want to do this? Would you want to do that? And I couldn't because either it was too far away or, you know, when you come from an immigrant family, family is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And at a young age, you can't really go to a boarding school. You yeah. can't really, or you can't really, school. you're yeah. a private school. You know, it's, it's like, no, why? Just go to a public school. You're nor- like, you, you, you'll do well. You do well. Everything pans out. And, you know, you, you had that growing up. And um, so I was always good. And then I got into high school. I went to this kind of sort of magnet high school here in New, in, in New York. It's in Harlem, actually. Uh, it's called Manhattan Center for Science and Math. Shout out to MCSM. Um, and where there, I think that's where my life transitioned in a sense, where I was, you know, I was doing well. I got into school and I just, you know, started, you know, you follow the wrong crowd in your teenage years. Yes. Um, doing the wrong things that you mm-hmm. shouldn't be doing, you know what I mean, or not moving as Just good. because you're around them. Just because you're you re- around you don't, them. You don't know much better, like. Exactly. Yeah. And then you're frustrated with your situation. I'm a poor kid from the Bronx and it's like you're, you're you know what I mean? Like there's, there's just a lot of things that frustrates you about the world of being a black man in, in America and being poor, yeah. man. Like, it's, 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 it's hard. People don't know that. It's, it's really hard, man. It's real. And, you know, I just, I just didn't have the right guidance around me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it led me to a path where, you know, I, I don't regret it in any way because it's, it's, it's sort of, for me, it was, it was, it, it was a learning experience where I, it, it helped me gain this perspective that I have now. And basically, you know, I, I was just following the wrong crowd. I almost failed out of high school. Like, it was really... You almost fell out of high school. I, I can't even imagine that now the, because the, of exactly, where you are now. Exactly. Exactly. And it it, it was, I think, my, my freshman year of high school, mid, mid-sophomore mid year, I was really, you know, I was on the basis, like, they were, they were talking to me about, like, kind of already transitioning. Hey, you want to transition to GED? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? It's crazy. Really? It's crazy. And it wasn't because I was going to school and, like, failing classes because that wasn't the case. I would, yeah. It was actually so scary that one time I showed up for a history test, right? a class that I hadn't showed up for for like literally six months or something and then I went in and at the time I went into high school I, 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 like I went into high school yeah. and um, uh, with with like uh, high school credits through my old school because I was yeah. in a school that allowed you to take advanced courses and do that so I'm in there and I'm in a history class and I'm like oh I know this, this like and I took a test literally scored like 90 something 
And the teacher grabbed me the next day. I actually went to, just to get my score back. This is one of the, yeah. like, I would never go to class for some weird reason. I was, you know, <laughs> just caught up on the wrong stuff. And the late, you know, the teacher grabbed me. She said, how in the world did you do, did you get, like, how did you get this? Did you cheat? Like, how did you do this? And I'm like, if I cheated, did anyone get higher than me in, in the class? She said, no. So how did I cheat? If I, you know what I mean? Yeah. And she was like, how do you know this? And I told her, I was like, I already took this stuff. I knew this stuff. Like, this is nothing. It was natural, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm, and, and I was very fortunate. I, I didn't appreciate it then. Yeah. But now I do in hindsight. But, um, you know, I, I, I was always, you know, I always had that capacity to learn and knowledge and had that and to preserve knowledge. It's just that I was caught in a time in my life where I was not applying that. And again, I think a lot of people do go through some sort of that as mm -hmm. a teenage years. They're, you know, you revel, you go through, you know, just fr and for me, I think it was duly, it was all due to frustration of just like my current situation, my family, you know, not having the, 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 the resources that I think they deserved. Yes. And at the time where I was too young to take matters into my own hands. But then, you know, I had an epiphany one time where, you know, um, I had an epiphany in, 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 in middle school where, uh, I'm sorry, middle school, in high school where um, my, my mom got me a gift. Uh, like a game, a video game, and to me, I know, and I know it sounds so silly. I know it sounds like so ridiculous, but literally, it just struck me. I was like, I got to get my shit together because my mom, even I'm putting her through all this stuff, putting yeah. my parents through all this stuff, and they're they're they don't have that much money to go, you know, to, to in the first place. Um, I had an older brother that lived with us, uh, and 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 he was busting his ass, you know, for 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 you know, God knows how long hours in a day just yeah. to at least help us make ends meet, and. Um, you know, for them to do that for me, I felt like, no, I got it. I owe it to them. Mm -hmm. I, I have to like, I just cut all this shit out. I'm frustrated. Oh, well, if I'm frustrated, I got to do something about it. Right. So then I started to focus. I, I sat down. I literally wrote a plan. I wrote a, I wrote a 10 year plan for myself. For your life. For my life. Yeah. And I was at the, I was about the age of, I was just turned 16, I believe. No, no, sorry. I was 15 going on 16. Yeah. And, um, I sat down and I said, you know what? Mahmoud is my full name. I go by Mo, but um, and I said, I told myself I have to write a ten-year plan. I said where I need to be by the time I hit a quarter century or whatever it is, right? And what I need to do and where I want to be. So I sat down and started formulating things. Is one, I need to find a career, right? Mm -hmm. High-level, you know, strategy as to like what I need to do. I need to get. I need to. At the time, I think I had like a sixty average or sixty-five average. If you know, in New York, you can only get like sixty-five, right? Yeah. Um. And I wrote that down and I said, you know what, Mo has to get, you know, I have to get my shit together and I have to get to where I want to be. So I, I, I said, I have to get a career. I have to go to college, to go to a good college. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. I have to do that. And then. And you stuck to it. Uh-huh. And you stuck to it. And I stuck to it. I executed. I literally executed. I started going to every class. I said, this. I realized that it's all, it's all a system and it's yeah. all a game if yeah. you knew how to. If you show up. If you show up. Well, actually, that's a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was the hardest part. But yeah, for me it was. Um, you show up. A lot of other things can take care of it. And you know, I had the tools to do the rest. And I did, and then um, so from high school, I was able to get my act together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was getting you know averages above you know hundreds in, in classes, and and I, you know I really like school. I really you know beat the game in that sense, and 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 I was able to actually come out of it with a you know nearly you know three point oh GPA, whatever yeah. equivalent that is. Uh, well, sorry, three uh, three two or something, mm -hmm. and then. Um, from there, I was able to leverage that into Fordham. Into Fordham, and then when I when I the reason I chose Fordham uh, was one, it was a, people don't know it's a Jesuit school, so that's like a Catholic yeah. school. It's a or, it's it's a, it's, a, it's an order of Catholicism that was actually created to in 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 response to Protestantism when Martin Luther was mm -hmm. you know when his thing was popular within Europe, and um, uh, basically I, I I knew it was a Catholic school, but where I was was I was poor. I needed money. Two, I needed a good school institution. I was going to get me a job, yeah. which I didn't find out what I wanted until later, a little bit later, but needed to be a job. Mm -hmm. And then I also needed to be close to my family because my dad at the time was getting older. My mom was getting older. And that's where my dad started having a lot of health issues, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they kind of needed me to be there. They yeah. needed me to kind of be close to them. And I wanted to be close to them. So um, out of the north, Forum was the best choice. It gave me a shit ton of money. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you know, for the Go for ahead. Go Shit ton of money, and they just, uh, you know, you know, it just all the stars aligned with them, uh -huh. and they gave me that opportunity, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna do this. Uh, this, 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 this is, this is where I want to be, and where I want to go, and I loved it. It was a great experience to me. It was uh, a shell shock, you know. Thinking from just a demographic perspective, it helped me a lot. Yeah. You know, I went from you know schools in Harlem and Bronx and, and all to these to a private school. To, to a private so higher education school. Where you were the minority now. Where I was the, oh my God. Like, I mean, Denard <laughs> yeah. can tell you all the time yeah. that it is, it is, it was, it was, you know, uh, numbers were not, you know. It, it, Especially yeah. not playing sports. 
not playing sports exactly. Right. So it dwindled that down. So I'm I'm a, I'm a black non non sport playing non athlete. You know, a kid in, at a at a at a uh, what my HBCU friends would call a PWI, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's it's sort of it changed me in a way where it allowed me to learn and allowed me to adjust and understand my environment and understand that and allowed you to blend in exactly so your next move the corporate setting exactly corporate so we'll, setting so we'll talk about that here in a little bit yeah, yeah yeah let's do that so now getting into corporate America so um, you went from Fordham to then J P Morgan um, and you had two different things um, when you first started out you were in a corporate analyst program yeah um, and then you moved into the asset management space so yeah. uh, what I want you to do is kind of talk about you going from Fordham, getting into that program, um, how much money you were making um, yeah. coming out of um, college into your first job in corporate America, uh, and then some of the things that you were doing and how you decided on um, asset management versus uh, the corporate setting. Yeah, and if, if, if you remember, this is this is basically the conversation that we, we met and we talked right yes, when we first we did met, talk. right? And, 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 and you and dropped a lot of knowledge for me. And I have to. Because no one, no one else was telling me no this. No one will. No one will, man. And I, that's one frustration I have with, with corporate America, and especially within our, you know, I guess affinity or within our within our um, diverse uh, background, uh, you know, all skin folk aren't kin folk, right? In yeah. a sense, and I learned yeah. that, and I learned that unfortunately, and it's and it's, it's sad because there aren't many of us in the in the corporate space in the first place. Secondly, I think we need to have honest discussions with ourselves, honest open conversation, and open honest. and be able to open forums you know, where people put can me ask on questions, game, man. You know what and I mean? like, yeah. there's no repercussions. Like, if I'm, I ask, I, I think I asked you a question about like. like What's the salary range for like new analysts? Like exactly. I don't know because exactly. I, I need to benchmark myself. Exactly, exactly, and and there's just so many things like you know like what the program and why it's better to go through programs versus say direct roles or or or, or just it's it, it's 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 what I try to do as much as I can is when people ask me things like that, I try to be open and help them as much as I and yes, I believe and you help me. <laughs> I try, I try, man, and it, it's it's to the best I can do. You know what I mean? And it's 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 about. You know, putting that much knowledge into people. So to, to 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 give the broader audience kind of a sense of of how it is. So when I when I when I was in Fordham, uh, I actually worked in the library. Right, I had mm -hmm. a multitude of jobs, man. I had various roles. I, I worked in retail. I worked at a store called Pretty Girl. For anyone that's been in New York, like uh, in really? the of New York, like <laughs> literally, I was, dude, I was assistant man. Even before I was there before Fordham, I was assistant manager, like sixteen over there. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it was crazy. Like I was the youngest one, and and you know, I've always had that drive. I've always had that um um kind of uh, a go-getter attitude because at the end of the day I realized you know like I said my family matters most and yeah. my, my future family my my current family and even my future family my generations will matter so mm -hmm. I need to you know get all my stuff and, and 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 go out and do this and that's that's usually what fuels my ambition but um you know when, when I was at Fordham you know I had all these jobs I've, I've had all this experience you know I worked in you know in my local assemblyman's office I worked at uh that's crazy. Uh, it's crazy, uh, dude. It was crazy. And then, um, you know, I was in economics class by chance and by luck. It was just like, you know, one of those things where, as a kid, I was always, you know, math was a was a great subject of mine that I loved. And Me I loved, too. Yeah, man. And for, I, for I, some reason, I don't know what it was, but I always got it. I got it. There it is. Now, now, I said love just two seconds ago, but I really mean love because it was more just like, or right, I was good at it. It yeah. was just like, yeah, I'm good at this. All right, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm good at. It. Let, let's see. What for for me, when I was growing up, and sorry to cut you off, but for yeah, me, when no. I was growing up, like social studies, like I wasn't good at, like literature, like I wasn't good at. Yeah. But when it came to math, there was just something that clicked, and when I did it, like I would see a math problem and then be able to do it. Like wow, no matter what. Yeah, yeah, same. And so same. I kind of took that into. That's how I kind of moved into the finance space because mm -hmm. I was like, well. This has to do something with numbers, so I might as well do it. Exactly. But what I really didn't know is corporate is completely different. different. And Way when different. it comes to the numbers, that's like second tier for what I'm doing personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. Agreed, agreed, 100%. And, and for me, it's also my fear was I didn't want to do anything that it, just because I was good at it, I didn't want to do it. You know, I, mean, I yeah. wanted to do something. For me, what mattered, again, if you think about my humble background, you think about my, you know, the, 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 the you know, I was good at math. I knew I was good at math. I was like, I needed to find something that paid well, mm -hmm. but I also needed to find something that I had a passion for, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I went into economics class and, and I was fortunate where they, you know, they weren't just talking about math. They weren't just talking yeah. about like, they, they were like, hey, like, like, remember, like, what's going on with, this is, mind you, this is really right after the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, Wall Street was a hot topic. And in that econ, our first econ class, we were talking about like how it happened. Like, what yeah. what is debt? What is... Case studies on it. Case studies. Yeah. Like, what is going on here? Like, like, not just your supply demand fundamentals, but just, you know, things like... Hey, this is how you know. This is why people you know took out so much debt and why they can't pay this stuff back. This is why it happened. Exactly. You, they applied the math and like current events and showed you why. Because I was an economics minor yeah. as well. Yeah. And it showed you if something happens over here, oh, this yeah. is going to be the effect. No exactly. matter what anyone says, like if this happens, this yeah. will happen. Just because like 
price, supply, demand. Things exactly. were like, um, fundamentals. Minimum wage, things exactly. like that. When when they were telling me about the minimum wage and how if you raise the minimum wage, then that doesn't always lead to more jobs. Exactly. And people need to real and it actually will constrict and it will constrain fo- um, employers from and actually hiring businesses. more people in small businesses. People don't understand. So when I hear people, you know, talk about this Bernie Sanders kind of hey, let's just make everyone give them everyone a livable wage. A livable wage is right. I think that should be done. Yeah. But there's there's something there's there's an economic fundamentals that te- teach you, you know. You don't want a uh, one minimum wage that's constraining, right? On the on the supplies exactly. in the labor market. Exactly. So if you if you are off, you're saying that minimum wage is fifty dollars, but this role actually would actually just pay forty, which is still a minimum wage, a uh, livable wage. Yeah. But the minimum wage is higher; they have to adjust to that. That's less money that they can pay other folks and other things. So what exactly. happens is so people they, have to. They can't hire more. They can't hire more. They, they can they can hire less people. Exactly. The people will make that fifty dollars wage that you were talking about, but yeah. now they can't do other things like invest in their business. And then and for smaller businesses, that's a killer. And even bigger inflation, right? Because now every yes. wage growth is happening, so people are getting paid a lot, right? What happens? All the other people who are rent goes up. Rent your rent starts Grocery's going up. Go- Everything goes up. And yeah. now it's like, shit, this $50, $50 wasn't really what I thought it is. It's really just the 40 that was 10 days ago. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's not. It's, and a lot of people don't understand they that. They don't get that. And, and, and when I learned that in economics, I was like, wow, I love this. Exactly. Boom. And that was me. And, and I think and I think for that, from that sense, it was for me, it was like, wow, like, like uh, 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 this is something I would love to, like, do. I can have a career out of this? Like, what is this? Yeah. So my, my other thing was I could be an uh, economist, but mm-hmm. that, that would require a PhD. Yeah. Which, maybe, hey, who knows? Maybe 20 years online I might do. <laughs> But um, I, I was like, nah, not really. I, I like to talk to people. I, I do like teaching. Teaching wasn't one of my passions. So I was, you know, I, I, I was thinking about the PhD rep, but I was like, no, I need, again, back to the family is, no, I need, I need some money. The I need coin. some income. Yeah. I need to get going. I'll, I'll build my, myself and my generation, my wealth, and then I'll come back, maybe do teaching from that sense. Um, so for me, I was like, all right, I can't do that. So what, what else can I do? So then I started talking to people within our career services office, which is why one of the things I love at Fordham and I give back a lot to Fordham. Yeah, you're an, on the alumni board, right? I'm on the alumni board, um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably the second youngest on the board now. Um, and it's, 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 it was a great experience. I was honored. I was asked by the president to join, a president of the university, Father McShane, to, to, to join. And um, it's been an unbelievable experience. And one of the things we do is like help folks with career. Like we, we actually have created and, and we're, we're hosting our third annual um, career fair for alumni solely. So it's 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 That's folks. Dope. Yeah. So like you know, think of our, our mutual network. The folks you know yeah. from Warren. I'm like they, if they need a job, they could come to this strictly for alumni. You know, mm-hmm. on campus kind of. They can talk to recruiters right there. Get a sense of what's available. Get a sense of where their resume is. You know get your resume reviewed right on the spot. It's unbelievable access to, 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 to employers that you may have not be able to do on your own. It's exactly. so hard out yeah. there. People know to get so a job. as an experienced person. Oh, like, it's so hard. If you have a couple years of experience, you're kind of pigeonholed. Exactly. When, yeah. even though you want to do something else or you're qualified to do something else, if exactly. you're in a certain role, and this happens at JPM a lot. Oh, yeah. If you're in a certain role, oh, then yeah. people only will hire you for that role. Exactly. Um, whereas if you want to look for another role, they'll say, hey, we would hire you, but you need to have two or three years of experience. Exactly. How are you going to get that if you if you can't get into the role? Exactly, right? That, that, and, that, and that's the trick, right? So so I learned that, and again, and I was trying to teach you this, is, is, is that when I got to JP, it was... I had interned at another, you know, other banks, and I did banking. I worked in deals, and you know, I did all that fun stuff. Yeah. And for those who don't know finance and how finance works, you know, they hear finance, they think, oh, you work at J.P. Morgan. Oh my God, you must be, like, balling <laughs> yeah. in riches, or you work at Goldman, or you work at whatever bank name of bank you want. And no, we don't all do the same thing. We're all not getting paid the same. So different. So different. They're they're listen, people. Um, you know, I work. I sit next to someone who's a. Uh, uh, I used to, not now, but like I used to sit next to someone who was a biology major, right, in college, and it's yeah. like it's it, it, it's so many things you could do with the bank. It's crazy. Like you could you could be an engineer, you could be a coder, you could build applications, you could have a startup, you can have mm-hmm. all these different things within the bank. But just because you work in the organization does not mean we all do the same thing and we're getting paid the same. So when I came in, and 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 again, I don't I don't want to offend anyone that's out there that's that's as part of the, in this you know finance track, um, but. I came into corporate finance, so originally, you know, again, I didn't have that understanding of how a bank works. I just knew corporate finance sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good, and yeah. I thought that's what it was. So when I interned, I was doing, you know, real estate debt, you know, um, investing and sizing up deals, and we were doing again more institutional wise, um, um, institutional focus. So I thought finance was just that. I didn't think it was like yeah. anything else. So when I got into corporate finance, I realized. You know, this isn't for me. This yeah. is not. This is not what I signed up. It was more like more core accounting. Exactly. More actual like a reporting rather than actual deals, deals Client or flow. clients. Yeah. And yeah. I, that was the part that the latter is really what stuck to me because 
I'm I, I consider myself a really outgoing person. Yes. And I realize though all the time that regardless if you're in finance or wherever it is, if you're in a role where you're able to, you know, contribute to the bottom line of the firm, right? Yeah. Though you're going to be the most valued. Unfortunately, that's how it works, right? Exactly. Bring yeah. in revenue. You, you bring in revenue. That's they're going to love you, right? Mm-hmm. Because without you, then there would be all these other jobs wouldn't exist, right? Yep. In, in, in theory, and if you can contribute toward that or work on a team that does that, then that's where you want to be, and that's where you would have the highest visibility and the highest opportunities, right? So I realized this um, going in that I was like, wait, this finance stuff is not for me, unfortunately. Um, and I how would, much were you make when you when you came in? So when I came in, I think I was offered sixty k. Really? Yeah, yeah, it was bad. It was, it was. I mean, again, at the time, it, it it this was about what six, seven years ago. Yeah. So I was making sixty k when I came in. To me, again, kid from the Bronx, I'm working at JP Morgan. I'm thinking, this is it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. fixing yeah, like that's a lot to me. It was. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it 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 was just a lot at first. But then you realize after you start growing up and you have these, you know, um, um, responsibilities and things you have to pay for and rent and all this stuff. You're like, what? Especially rent in New York. <laughs> oh God, bro! Yeah. Tell me about it. And um and and and. You know, I realized that this was a net. This is not one, not what I was liking to do. I wanted to talk to clients. I want to get back in front of clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, that honestly, I I couldn't see myself progressing where I where I believed I could be. Yeah. And that made me realize, all right, I need to get out of here. But now, like you said, how do we do that? It's so hard. It's so hard to move once you've got even just a year or two. Even though they talk about mobility, it's yeah. so hard. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and 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 even even I mean, not this is listen. I love JP. They pay my checks. They've done well for me. They, they they've you know given me opportunities where I am today, and 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 uh, and I hope that continues forever. And um, uh, but. You know, they're, they're, they it's it's not just them. It's industry wide, not just industry wide, but also just corporation wide. It's it's you hear diversity, you hear about this, you, you hear um, and yeah. you got to think about where is this diversity? Where are these roles? Because when I look around, yeah, it's not there. It's not there. When you look around, you know, it, it's really not there. Like yeah. at all, at all. And and I was always again being as a function of you know being the same business person. Kind of I always had blinders on and. My career, I gotta get there. I never really stuck back for a second and looked and said, "Wait, like, um, where, where, where's all this diversity? We're talking about diversity stuff. So this is, people really don't look like me here, you know? Yeah. I mean, and it shouldn't really, it shouldn't, to me at least, I think, impact you know anything because I think the color, the colors, race is a social construct. Yeah. But other people don't think like that. Mm-hmm. Other people, you know, view race as race and, and still have these, you know, and there's systematic connotations yeah, it, connotations yeah. to it and, and this institutionalized kind of, 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 of processes that they don't even realize are inherently, you know, yes. you know, divisive. Mm-hmm. So when they're doing diversity recruiting, you see that a lot of the folks tend to be in those operational roles. Yes. They'll tend to be in, in more what we call in finance back, back office. office kind of, you know, uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. I'd be I'd be, you know. I, I not just J, but all the our all of our all of our industry. I'd love to see what the um you know the the diversity numbers are for purely front office personnel, and That's, I think that would really scare people, right? It, and some of the numbers have come out, and it's yeah, very scares, especially at the senior manager level. Oh, unbelievable! MD level, it's like it's pretty much non-existent. Unbelievable, unbelievable, and you know actually. Uh, uh, shout out to Valerie Rainford, um, who's a trustee at yes. Fordham University as well. Yeah. She's also she was also the f- uh, head of uh, diversity at J.P. Morgan before that, and before that was Pat David, another Fordham alum. Um, uh, shout out to her as well, mm-hmm. who you know I've, I've had these discussions with, and 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 people understand that that's the problem, right? But you have to understand that you can't force someone to say you need to hire more X, you Y, P people. You just you can't, can't do it. Yeah. And there and, and, and on the other end, too, people are willing. You know, these days and age, I know it's like people, race is still an issue, but people, you know, they want to. Managers do want to actually um, hire diverse talent. And even so, in, in, in JP, one of the ways that they rate managers within the office is your diversity, you know, um, recruiting. Like if you're able really? to, yeah, retaining, I did not know that. Yeah, it's it's one of the measures. It's public. You guys can Google this. You can look it up in the in the in the compensation policy. Yeah. Like it's it's one of the things. Like they're rated. Like they're given a review on you know their their diversity commitments and things they're doing. So with the military, with with, yeah. with you know our, our affinity groups and things like that. And but the thing is, you have to understand that there are systematic things in place that even they don't realize is kind of removing it. So. You know, you're, you're, if you think of a corporate setting, you're working with someone over 50 hours, 60 hours, 70, sometimes even in some places, 80 hours a week. Yeah. And you want to, you know, the, the, you're you going to see work the, with them. Yeah, you have to work with you them. You're going to see them more them. than yeah. your own family, your dogs, your your your, your wife, your spouse. It doesn't matter. You're going to work with these people more than anyone else in this world. And you want to be comfortable with that person. Yes. So 
And, and your, your first thought is not going to be, oh, because this person's X, Y, I don't want to work with him. It's going to be, he doesn't, you know, maybe this guy doesn't golf like I do. He, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he doesn't watch golf. Doesn't he didn't watch go sports. to the same private school. He didn't go to the same private school. Or he doesn't he, have a vacation house. Doesn't have, exactly. He has a beard. Oh, my God. He has a beard. Like, yeah. oh, who does that? Oh, what are those lines on his head? Are those like, the, like yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, 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 to them, it's not racist. And it, in a sense, I guess you can argue it's not, but it really, it's, it's inherently it is, right? Yeah. And those kinds of difference and those norms that, you know, people like us who are more demographic may have not been exposed to. I was never ex- exposed to a golf course until my first internship. We had a client. Yeah. Right. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, it's cool. And we're on like Beth Page Black. And that's like, that's like, <laughs> yeah, if anyone who knows, go, like that's, that's, that's legit. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. I did not know what, I, you know what I mean? But yeah. it's, 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 you know, and then just think about, you know, people go skiing. Like even now, I, I realized mm-hmm. I remember we were like planning a ski trip. And it's like, I don't ski. I never skied in my life. Like, I mean, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. tried. I tried. Yeah. But again, it was only later in my life was I exposed to that. These are folks who've had this in their life since they're, you know, a kid, a kid. Right. I didn't. So these are kind of some barriers that don't allow you to 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 really mesh with your teammates and mesh with your group and mesh with people. And then when you're interviewing, they're like, wait, we don't have anything in common with this guy. What what, what, what am I going to like? So it's not about race anymore. It's just about I don't have anything in common with you. But it's uh, tends to be that we don't have that because our race has been. If anyone knows the history of America, it's uh, like. African American population has been marginalized from from literally from slavery on to now yeah. in, in terms of you know like even now by either laws or laws. social constructs social like constructs like, exactly there's just certain things that you were told you cannot do exactly like if I wanted to buy a house in certain area even t- today at New York I remember New York I read a study about how New York State was like going on a cover for these real estate agents where people who yes. were who were who were who were black and they would reach out to these to these agents and they would only show them like these um, black neighborhoods or, or diverse neighborhoods and they would go show a counterpart, a male counterpart, who was making a, a significantly less than they were, yeah. and had less credit, you know, um, 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 risk, and I mean more credit risk, mm-hmm. and they were shown the higher ending, the more the more exactly. affluent neighborhoods. I think I saw that as well, and it came out to where the black client was like the buyer, yeah, and they had their surrogate go out and say, hey, I want to look at this. Um, and it was something that they weren't shown previously, like yeah, you said. Yeah. And they got it under contract, and then at closing, the black client showed up. Showed and up. Like, yeah. No, we can't do this. Yeah. yeah isn't that right? nuts? Isn't that nuts? And and to folks who still think out there, I know some people still think it that, that race isn't an issue. Look at that. So even if I were, you know, if I became CEO of Jamie Moore, you know, and and actually just to give you a funny story. I remember Mayor Dinkins. There was a funny thing about Mayor Dinkins, mayor of New York, who was a black mayor at the time. Uh, have you, you know, um, if you guys ever heard the saying, it's like a black man can't get a New York a cab in New York, a yellow cab in New York, and it's real. I've been in suits in the middle of Midtown trying to hail down a cab, yeah. and told, and literally they'll look at me and wa- a little drive away, <laughs> but stop for my coworker who's five feet ahead of me, yeah. and like, and you'll still get in the same cab, and I'll still get, and they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry, but they'll apologize, and I'm like, I don't want to hear you, goddamn, but like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, it's 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 real. And Mayor Dinkins, like at the time, Mayor, literally was in in sweatpants and a hoodie in the middle of Manhattan trying to get a cab and couldn't get a cab. And and it was it, it just goes to show that listen there are there's just connotations and things that people still have for race and it impacts us every day. So anyway, so that goes to to ask to why it's so hard for us to really break in and, yeah. and when we do, it's so hard for us to mesh and develop ourselves and then you know or, br- or bring others with you because a lot of times when you come in, you're not even in that position where you can hire. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You're in the position where you're the employee exactly. and you're working. It's not until years and years later exactly. that you can actually get in that to that position. But it takes time. If right? you're even lucky to get in that position, right? If you're even lucky, because the the promotion process is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Tell me about it. And it's not very transparent, right? It's not at all. Not at all. And, and it's pretty subjective. It very is. And, and and what I what I suggest anyone that's in Wall Street is. You know, or in any corporation with, with sort of that kind of nature is, you know, try. And how I thought about it was I need to get in something. One, that's in front of clients that's in that area that, that you know, I like to talk to clients. Yep. I actually like to do yep. that. And, and that, that, that contributes toward our bottom line. And then as well, um, something that would allow uh, 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 that, that's more objective than a subjective. So when I was in corporate finance. Mm-hmm. They were more like, oh, they talked about, oh, wow, you have great Excel skills. Like, why is that even a, <laughs> yeah. why is that even a measure? No, talk Excel about and, my job. Excel you, and PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm like, okay, or, you should. Or you're, you're, you have good communication skills. Like, Shouldn't you already have great communication? <laughs> why am I even like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, 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 it's something that, it, to me, it's like, and, I, and, and it's all the ratings. I think you're either doing your job or you're not doing your job. Yeah. It's, it's the, black and white. You're doing your job. You could be doing it well, but you're still just doing your job or you're not doing your job. That's it. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, you can't pay everyone the same because 
then, you know, I mean, I think you could, you should. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of performance, you have to have a measure of performance. Yes. But when you're in roles where performance is subjective, with things that are very subjective. It's like... It's like, really? Yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas, so what I thought was, I need to get into something that's more objective. That's more like, this is, you can I brought an X amount of dollars. Exactly. Quanti- I did X amount of deals. Exactly. My pay should be based off of Exactly. That. Or or in a, in a, in a that, so I, I always tell people, you know, if you're in a role where it's very subjective, where it's really just, oh, uh, I like Kim because, you know, he he says hi, or it's all about your friendships, about who you know, or yeah. about the, that you stay the longest for, for, for in happy hours, or you're leading. The, like, no, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about your work and your... And your job and your duties. Are you fulfilling your, the duties of your job? And are you exceeding at those at those jobs? And 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 how does that compare to your peers quantifiably? Exactly. Not he 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 does. You know he makes his pre- presentation prettier. Mm-hmm. So now on the point about compensation. So yeah. um, you're in an asset management role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably getting paid pretty decently. Yeah. Um. So I want to know um about Thank some God. of your investments um outside of work. Yeah. So you do deals 24-7 with, for your clients, um, and yeah. you're raising funds. Yeah. Um, but outside of work, do you have any type of investments? Do you, are you investing in the stock market? Do you know do things like in real estate or anything like that? Yeah, personally, I think um, right now what I've been doing is focused on uh, my, you know, again, back to my connection to Sudan, is is my, I'd say a lot of my portfolio is there, yeah. invested there in terms of real estate and in terms of that. So uh, I'm working on that on that end, um, just trying to build my my. I guess presence there a lot more through real estate, through you know just 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 operations and things like that there. Um, but what we were talking about earlier, and I think we should touch on is 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 in terms of a personal. I mean, of course, I have retirement plans yeah, and things like yeah. that. But for folks out there who think you know that they should you know become a day trader or like just buy an equity or buy a thing, and as a fiduciary you know uh, advisor, uh, investment <laughs> advisor, I have to tell you like that's not necessarily that's not suitable. For, for the regular average retail folk that we talked about earlier. Um, you should not, you know, people think that, hey, look, I'm going to make money. I'm going to go into the stock market. Well, you know, all these FX scams and all these <laughs> yeah. things. Like, oh, yeah, I'm an FX trader. I'm doing that. Binary thing. option, yeah. Yeah, like, no, this is not binary option. Exactly. Like, the, no, this is not, <laughs> you shouldn't be, that's not how you're going to make money. That's not how you're going to, you know, you don't buy a stock today and then worry about it the next day and think, oh, my God, it's doing bad. No. Investing, equity investing, when I mean equity, by the way, it's, it sucks. Um, equity or even fixed income investing in general is supposed to be a long-term hold dependent on a, on your case. So if your case is specifically, if you're an older person, maybe your hold period is a little shorter, right? Maybe five to your, ten your, years. Your trajectory is a little shorter. Exactly. It might be a five to ten years, but it's not a day-to-day thing. Once you do a day-to-day thing and you're trying to make money off the margins, you have to understand if you're not a professional investor who has been doing this for n- more 10, 15 years, yeah. You're probably gonna end up on the short side uh, with the short side of the stick more than anything. You should just put your money in, in, in like <laughs> yeah. a, you know, and and so let another manage whether it's a mutual fund, whether it's an index fund, S&P whether it's 500, an active ETF, yeah, like exactly, anything. whether ETF an active ETF, whatever it is. Let the professionals do their job for you because the minute you start having a day to day portfolio, what happens is you have to understand what you're doing. All right, you're going up against uh, Mo's boss's boss yeah. or or his colleague in equities who, who is are, built to do this. We talk about professional athletes. They're built to play exactly. football. They're built to slam dunk. Exactly. Whereas there's professional traders out there that are yes. built to kill the markets. Kill. And they do it and they're going up against you. So what's going to happen? Yeah, and it's live or death for them because if they don't do well, then they it's their job. Yeah, they yeah. can't feed for family. So you have to understand someone's been doing So like, like you said, yeah, perfect. Professional sports. You're going to play football in the NFL and like you think you could just take a football and start throwing <laughs> yeah. it and be Tom yeah. Brady winning Super Bowls? No. Yeah. Like, okay, maybe you can have a catch or two. You'll get some wins, but yeah. it's going to be luck. You know, it's not it's not a, a thing where you could, it, it, like, you know, buy a stock today and think it's going to make money in this much day and exit. And first of all, you have to buy in a scale that would actually make the profit worth it in terms of your transaction costs and things like that. Exactly. People, people don't realize that, too, as well. It's like, all right, I'm just going to buy one stock of Amazon, which, I mean, I don't know what's trading out today, but I know it's very, around $2,000. Around $2,000, right? It's who you're gonna put two thousand dollars in an Amazon stock, and then sell it five days later, and you think, oh my god, I made a ton of money! Like this five dollars I made on this is amazing, or whatever. Like like it's you can't eat off that. You can't live off. You that. Can't you can't? So you need to have big uh, scale, and 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 you know. So so I always tell people that it, you either do that, put that in there, and don't look at it for years to come if you're young. Yeah. Um, or at least give it to someone else who could, you know, manage it appropriately, um, or, or or another firm or, or professionals who can manage it. Another thing is people don't even realize as we were talking about this earlier. People go, you're going up against machines, algorithms, algorithms. These are machines that were built 
to that, that that were built to play the market. They think faster than you. There's millions of them, yeah. and they execute and in they milliseconds. Execute in milliseconds, they're in and out of a trade before you can even look up a quote. Exactly. Exactly that. So when you look up a quote, people don't realize that there's a delay on that quote, right? We mm-hmm. were talking about this earlier. There's a delay. And that's how they make their money. That's how they make money. And those two seconds that you press that click button by, they've already executed probably 300 trades. You don't even know about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's, it's Based it, on your decision that you queued it up. Exactly. Exactly. And you're thinking, you're thinking about this in a while. You're like, oh, man, should I buy this? All right, it's a good price now. Let me buy it before it goes away. Mind you, you're looking at a quote from five seconds ago that could have changed by now because of those computers. And people don't understand it. They are predicting how people, retail people like that who are inexperienced or yeah. are buying. And it's just not, the game is not set up for you. You're literally, in a way, you're setting yourself up to fail, right? Yeah. You're, 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 you're already ch- at a disadvantage. Yeah, exactly. And if you do make any money, it's not because you're, it was any skill or anything. It was literally pure, I don't know, you're buying in like a, 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 a low beta, you know, yeah. low beta a fund, which means a uh, low beta stock, which means basically it's, it's, it's flat to the market. Like it just follows the market and where it is. Um, and it was just luck. So that's all it was. It wasn't really that you had any skill and knew, Oh, Apple's going to do well. Or, or I think, you know, you know, you have to think about, you know, people who are putting this stuff in models and putting this inside their computers and letting them decide what the right thing to do is. Exactly. You, you cannot do that. So I, I always tell people just stay away from that. Stay away from per, uh, personal portfolios if you can. And if you do, Leave it with, uh, sorry, personal direct equity investing or expert exposure or fixed income exposure and leave that to the professionals to do that for you or put that in more indexed kind of products, which are, which are, which are kind of just follow the market in itself. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I think S&P, if you guys realize it's shot up, but I mean, it's obviously been like this yeah. the whole time. Yeah. And if you guys are buying it and selling, you might be in the wrong end of that, right? <laughs> yeah. So if you just, just let a lot it, of people buy high, sell low exactly. when they get scared. Exactly. That, that's the idea. But you got to understand, like, all right, it's it's low now, but then it'll be up later, and then it'll go down a little bit more, and then it'll be high, another high. And yeah. I think if, uh, this week is a perfect example. Exactly. Perfect examples. Dow and S and P were hitting records last week. This week was the worst week since the GFC. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. In public equity markets. So I think all those people with daily, and I know a lot of them, you know, were like with daily, um, you know, trading, like, like uh, they're investors. They're crying. They're yeah. like, oh my God, this is the worst. I should never did this. I, uh, I'm you. buying. I would buy. I yeah. mean, I, 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 yeah, I, <laughs> hey, look, hey, look, I, I have to, I, I, we'll put the, the disclaimer is like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's, it's, this is only if it's suitable for you. It's suitable for myself. This does not reflect any any recommendation or anything like that to anyone else. But it's it's uh, you have to understand that that you know these these things these things happen. Yeah. And I do I do want to give you uh, before we get out of here. I want to yeah. talk about some of uh, your goals for 2020. Yeah. Um, just in a in a couple minutes, your goals for 2020, and then your five year plan, and then before that um, or after that, we'll give you um, a chance to put out your social media so yeah. someone wants to reach out to you. Yeah. Yeah. So for 2020, what I'm focused on is basically uh, uh, per, from personal no, not even investing in personal finance. Not, um, I'm trying to buy you know my family a home. Mm-hmm. Um, here in New York? Yeah, here in New York, my extended family. So, again, when I moved here with my uncles and everyone else, it, it, it's, it's, we're scattered across the Bronx. And what I want to do is, like, put them all into one, you know, one big place and call it a day and let yeah. them, you know, even my younger cousins who, who, who would have an, an environment not be in such an urban environment have exposure and, and under, you know, gain perspective in other sites, sides of the world, right? Yeah. So um, I'm trying to do that. You know, it's hard to, to do so with, with so many different heads and, you know, people are yeah. old and it's, it's, it's a, but that, that, that's my goal. I think personally for 2020, another thing is to, um, what's, what's your fi- uh, five year plan? Yeah. My five year plan is one uh, advanced career. I think that's number one. I think top of my head. And um, I think I need to be in a, in a trajectory and where I f- see myself in an executive position, not executive in the sense of that, but in the next five years, at least to make, um, decisions as to how it, how it impacts our business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people don't realize that you could be, you know, in, in, in this Wall Street thing for 30 years and still not be able to, to hire and fire who you want. Or, exactly. Or even if you're, quote unquote, the head. Yeah, even if you're head or of the, the group. Or the CEO, you yeah. can be fired because you're an employee. That's it. You're an employee. So you, I want to get to a point where at least I can have some more flexibility, responsibility in that sense. Yeah. Um, also, I want to be able to, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, in the philanthropy front, I want to give back more. Mm-hmm. So I know I'm already doing a lot. I'm volunteering a lot of Ford. I'm on the board. I'm, I'm, I'm giving to uh, Morris Sloan Kettering, which I, I, I owe them so much. They're like just personally, I love those guys. Yeah. Um, I want to give more in that sense. I want to help more fundraising from a from a philanthropic perspective. I want mm-hmm. to get involved more with uh, more of those initiatives to to to, to do that. So. 
Um, I was actually thinking about starting a charity as well, okay. but not a. It, I mean, we can talk about that. I, I definitely want to hear about that, but yeah. um, I want to thank you for being on the show, man. Of course, man. Um, of course, this man. is the the last episode uh, for becoming financially fit. Save, so. save the worst for last. Thank you. No, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, no. Of season one, I, I really do appreciate you coming on the show, Mo Osman. Um, of course, and, thank you. Um, if people want to reach out to you, you can go to LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Um, Mo Osman. Um, also Instagram. What's your Instagram? Instagram Nubian Mogul. If you want, um, yeah, I am Nubian. As you guys know, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, um, Money Talks, the podcast, uh, season one, episode 10. Thank you. Thank you.